When the United States of America declares war on Imperial Germany in April 1917, our military is not ready for what it is about to dive into. Because what it's about to dive into is the rapid mobilization of an American expeditionary force that will travel across the Atlantic Ocean to land in France and then join the experience of trench warfare on the Western Front. This army went from 200,000 men to 2 million American troops deployed in France in the space of April 1917 to November of 1918. It was a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, the first Americans from the 1st Infantry Division arrived in Le Havre in late June, early July of 1917. But that was really a, a symbolic act. The regular Army divisions that were sent over weren't what we would think of necessarily as regular Army divisions. They'd been picked clean of men needed to form the cadres for the new divisions that were forming. Camps were being built all over the United States. These camps were set up to train the new men coming in to a revitalized, to an expanded United States Army. The British had some training, and the French not so much. But the lessons learned from American Civil War, you know, they sat down and realized that 150,000 Union soldiers had died, but only 75,000 Confederate soldiers. It means that the losing side outkilled the winning side at a rate of two to one. And, and you can't really win many wars if you're losing two to one. And so the establishment of the National Rifle Association, which rolled into the establishment of our national matches, our national competition, our marksmanship program, that elevated the level of marksmanship uh, in every aspect of our armed services. The first troops who arrive in France in May, June of 1917, are armed with both the Model 1903 Springfield rifle and the Model 1911 Colt automatic pistol. The Model 1903 Springfield had really kind of delicate sights, but these are sights that had been worked out through long range marksmanship. They could be adjusted uh, for windage. They could be adjusted for elevation. So if an American soldier or Marine who knew how to shoot had the range, he could put accurate fire out to a thousand yards. They did it every year at Camp Perry. The United States Army in 1917 was set up with regular Army divisions, uh, the 1st Division, the 2nd Division, the 3rd Division. Uh, there were National Guard divisions. One of the first to go over was the 26th Yankee Division. Uh, another National Guard division that would gain some fame, uh, the 42nd Rainbow Division that had troops drawn from all over the United States from National Guard formations. You had the 69th New York in there. You had troops from Alabama. You had literally men whose fathers and grandfathers had faced each other during the American Civil War, all united under a new system of infantry regiments, not named by state, but numbered by regiment. This is all that's left today of Ferme Croix Rouge. But a century ago, all of the buildings of the farm were completely intact, and they were outposted by Germans from the 4th Guards and the 10th Landwehr Division. On July 25, 1918, elements of the U.S. 42nd Rainbow Division moved into the tree line behind me. They were Americans from Ohio, New York, Iowa, and Alabama. The Alabamians comprised the 167th Infantry Regiment, and they, the following day, July 26, would carry out an attack on this farm. They were also supported by Iowans from the 168th Infantry Regiment. And they were to carry out this attack with no support at all, meaning there was no preliminary artillery bombardment, there was no gas attack, there would be no supporting fires during the attack. The first attack begins in the afternoon on the 26th. The Alabamians are mowed down by accurate automatic weapons and rifle fire by the Germans in the farm. Then an eerie silence descends over the battlefield for about an hour. And then on the far left of the line, a hundred men from the 1st Battalion of the 167th, a hundred Alabamians begin a renewed bayonet charge. Half of them are killed in the field of battle, but then the other half reach the farm. And as they storm the farm, 
they bayonet the German defenders that are found there. Simultaneous to this, men of the 3rd Battalion, 167th, on the right, and then the Iowans from the 168th join the attack as well. By dawn on July 27th, 1,100 Americans and Germans litter this battlefield. In the 167th alone, 162 Alabamians have been killed in action. And in action that's remembered to this day for its ferocity, for its viciousness, and an action that ends at the tip of a bayonet. You know, during the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, one of the famous lines that Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said was, you don't go to war with the army you want, you go to war with the army you have. And in 1917, it was very true back then as it is now. While the 1903 Springfield and the 45-1911 pistol were more than up to it for the AEF, the American Expeditionary Forces, going into France, uh, we really had a problem with machine guns. When the United States military geared up for World War I after war was declared in April of 1917, it's thought that there were less than 300 machine guns in the entire U.S. Army. At that time, that was about the number of machine guns in a German division. Obviously, this was not going to work. In the mid-1890s, John Moses Browning had come up with his potato digger and it was so named because it was gas operated and it had an arm in the front which would go up and down like this, cocking the mechanism. However, it really was an antiquated gun in comparison with the Maxim. Now the Maxim, again, an American uh, invention and uh, the U.S. Had, had adopted it in 1904, but we had very few of them. The Army continued to look at machine guns, but not necessarily buy lots of them. They'd test them, they'd write about them, there'd be articles in Arms in the Man about this new machine gun that the Army was testing, but they just simply didn't buy quantities of them. And let's face it, machine guns are expensive, and the pre-World War I era, not a lot of money was allocated uh, to defense appropriations, and certainly not to machine guns. We also made use of this firearm called the Bene Merci machine gun, uh, feeding from a non-flexible feed strip. And the Bene Merci was not exactly a great firearm at the time of its adoption. It was a design that was commercially available and so the United States adopted it, used it during the Pancho Villa punitive expedition in 1916, but the firearm didn't really distinguish itself, and it didn't seem that it was up to the rigors of trench warfare on the Western Front. By 1915, the war's raging in Europe. The Army decides to do away with its Colt potato diggers, its Model 1909 Benet Merci, and with the 1904 Heavy Maxim, and instead go to the British Vickers, which in itself was simply another version of the Maxim. American fighting forces were equipped with foreign machine guns. This is why you see American forces using the Saint Etienne French machine gun. You also see them using the M1914 Hotchkiss machine gun. You see them using in large numbers and using successfully and effectively the French designed Shosha light machine gun. And this isn't the only category where the United States military was woefully unprepared and inadequate. American field artillery was also really just not up to snuff. And so American field artillery weapons are left behind in the United States and American fighting units are equipped with French 75s and French 155 millimeter GPF long range guns. And so, American small arms at the outset of the First World War are not just American-made, they're also foreign-made. On July 28th, 1918, just two days after the 42nd Rainbow Division took this, this is the Croix Rouge Farm, at the point of the bayonet, their next objective was to assault the Ork River. There are German defensive positions on the heights along the river, and that's where Corporal Sidney Manning's platoon was headed. His platoon commander and his platoon sergeant were killed. 
Corporal Manning took over the platoon, only 35 men left, and assaulted the German lines. He got into the German positions and he had to hold off German counterattacks with his automatic rifle. He poured fire into the Germans, exposing himself so the rest of his platoon, down to just seven men, could consolidate to position until other platoons could come up on their flanks. Corporal Manning was wounded nine times in this action, and he also used a show-show automatic rifle. Corporal Manning received the Medal of Honor.